Hi all, I have a fascinating game to show you today, which philosophically actually represents a structural debate, double pawns versus isolated pawns, or the dread, potential dread of the isolated pawn. We're going to be looking at Stockfish 11 versus one of the latest Leela networks, 62565. The time control is the fast and furious one minute with one second increment. And the opening scene set for this theoretical structural debate is within the Sicilian defense, in particular the four knights variation. So we have Stockfish 11 playing white, playing e4, and many thanks to DCAP for, for providing uh, some e excellent game examples. So the Sicilian defense, knight f3, e6. The Sicilian four knights, if you look up on wiki, is actually uh, given, suggested, as a kind of way of achieving a Sicilian Svechnikov bypassing the dreaded Rosalimo variation bishop b5. So as a Sicilian, as a Sicilian Svechnikov player myself, uh, if you played knight c6 immediately, bishop b5, my good friend Paul Georgiou tortured me with this in many, many blitz games and, <laughs> and other players, and it's become so in vogue. I think it did start with Paul Georgiou. They, the Super Grandmasters looked at Paul's games and decided uh, to make this very, very popular. There was also another player, Rosalimo, of course, <laughs> who might have played it as well. So bishop b5 is really an annoyance to Sicilian Svechnikov players. And it was thought that maybe, actually, instead of knight c6, you could play e6 first. And after d4, c takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3. You could be cheeky with knight c6 presented now. So bishop b5 makes far less sense here. Um, there's there's quite a few moves for white. Uh, here we're testing g3. And in fact, uh, so this is not really a critical test after knight db5 to transpose, transpose back into Svechnikov. But black has other very, very important options, especially bishop b4. So it doesn't have to use it as a tool for a Svechnikov. And this excellent course here, by the way, so Sicilian Defense Four Knights course, shows how it's a viable weapon in its own right with the bishop b4 lines. So the bishop b4 lines, as you might suspect, could statistically give white double pawns. And we see... Uh, an idea of this in this game g3 we see bishop b4 so this is completely kind of distinctive territory it's not using this four knights as a Sveshnikov tool a transposition tool it's it's a, an opening in its own right here and white's g3 sideline here it's not the critical test aims to at least discourage black from playing d5 so we have bishop g2 and black castles uh, here d5 is is really out of the question if black plays d5 here if Lila played that there'll be tactical punishment with queen e2 check and this would be extremely unfortunate this position this is very miserable for black indeed um, the isolated queen's pawn is a source of mis misery there's no real compensation going on for that uh, there's, there's nasty things happening so castling yes and now white castles and the recommendation you'll see in this excellent course is actually uh, a move which most uh, grandmasters play. Uh, there's a very, very high-level STEM game as well with David Navarra playing in the Prague 2019 tournament. So just last year, relative to this video, he played D6. That was a really, really interesting game where Knight CE2 was played. This looks a bit strange, but it's idea to try and harass the bishop, uh, it seems. Navarra played like this. And there was a very, very interesting offering of the dark square bishop. And in fact, uh, David Navarra went on to win a very interesting game here. I'll just quickly show you it. This is the David Navarra game. He sneaked a win of that pawn. That looks very naughty to do that sort of thing. But uh, it seems as though he might have got away with it in this particular game. And he played very aggressively over here. Won another pawn. And yeah, white's just collapsing. Uh, white resigned here. So that was... Michalik uh, 2585 against David Navarra 2707 so very very interesting game uh, with the move d6 which is uh, you know a very solid recommendable uh, move it's interesting that um, DCAP <laughs> gives me some games with d5 and I think this this is really uh, looking a little bit odd uh, 
I've I've referred to Leela as the master of pawn structure chess. Uh, you know, knowing the great thematic pawn breaks and how to manage structure. So doesn't d5 seem a little odd? Well, there's actually a structural debate here going on because if black can puncture the pawns here to give white double pawns, it's the isolated pawn versus the double pawns kind of debate is on. And in fact, so Leela did play d5, e takes, e takes, bishop g5. Uh, the first preliminary uh, tactical discussion here is black is actually potentially losing a pawn. Uh, so Leela took on c3 and played h6, volunteering a kind of positional gambit. So bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, so why can't white just take on d5? It turns out there's a bit of a backfire. White played rook b1, Stockfish avoided bishop takes d5, rook b1 was played. On bishop takes d5, it's interesting, but black seems to have uh, equality potentially with rook d8. Uh, for example, bishop g2, we can just take on d4 and get the pawn back. But what does white actually do in this position? Uh, white could play um, the forcing move, bishop takes c6, and then the tactical move queen f3 to get out of the pin, hit the black queen. This position, it seems actually uh, black might have enough to be okay it's only double pawns after all the extra pawn and uh, this position for example looks as though white shouldn't really have too much it, it might be just a drawn position uh, for a very theoretical angle even though technically white uh, appears to be slightly better technically but I suspect black has <laughs> an equal position in practice here so in fact um, stockfish avoided bishop takes d5 and the debate, the theoretical structural debate now between the isolated queen spawn and the double pawns is truly uh, on. It's going to be discussed. <laughs> so we have actually rook d8. This looks like a passive move. Uh, there have been many quotations in chess about isolated queen spawns, like it spreads gloom all around the board, someone once said. Uh, as Nimzovich recommended, uh, playing the isolated queen spawn. Uh, both with it and against it to get uh, a really good understanding of this positional element. But here, you know, it is complicated. White's got um, double pawns, but you could argue, well, the double pawns provide dynamic pressure on the B file as well. Uh, we have actually rook B5, and this looks uncomfortable, this position. But where is the potential for the side to evolve the best from this start position? We have rookie one and now b6 <laughs> and it looks crazy but uh, you know it weakens that diagonal in theory as if uh, c4 is going to be dangerous but unless c4 can actually concretely be, pl be played this bishop although it's supposed to be like discouraging activities like this uh, if black can get away with it the idea is bishop a6 and then to start piling up the pressure for the discussion on the c3 pawn we have queen f3 being played in this position and Leela took that, bishop takes, and now rook d7. It looks a little bit on the passive side. In fact, I would usually argue, isn't white more comfortable here with that nice knight on d4, the blockading knight? You can say this, the same thing uh, about the double pawns, though. And in fact, the blockader, especially in the end game, if you consider a king coming to c4, the double pawns uh, will make it more difficult compared to straight pawns, <laughs> straightened pawns, because uh, by the time the king comes to c4, there's no, there's no c3. The b2 pawn on, on, on b2 does the job of protecting c3. So imagine uh, this route uh, later, just from a theoretical point of view, that the king could actually come to c4. So yes, whilst at the moment the comfortable blockade on, on d5 is there, but there's there's a, an attacking blockading point on c4 as well to consider in this kind of theoretical discussion. Uh, we have a4, which looks logical enough, trying to dissolve uh, pawns. Uh, now, bishop a6, the rook drops back. Okay, rook c7, the pressure is starting to be felt. White defends that with rook e3. King f8, we have rook a1, 
bishop c4, so blockading and getting out of the way of tactics. But also the bishop is about to be cemented, it seems, after a5, b5, cementing that bishop. A fascinating position indeed from a theoretical perspective. If I were to ask you, please leave comments in the video, at this point, do you consider that the isolated queen's pawn is a lesser evil than the double pawns? Uh, sometimes there's that question uh, of least worst or lesser evil is another expression. Who has the least worst position structurally, black or white here, in your view? Uh, I think this requires some, not just positional judgment, but concrete analysis as well. Uh, rook e, e1, we have knight c6, so challenging the d4 blockading knight. Uh, knight f5, rook d8, knight goes back to e3, knight e7, rook e, d1, and we have g6, rook a, b1, a6. So black seems pretty stable here with this bishop perched on c4. Uh, so rook d d2, or rather rook d2, uh, rook c5, g4, g5, and this marks out that f4 square, that could be handy as well in the future. King g2, knight g6, in fact the knight's looking at f4 already. Here uh, bishop a2, uh, so there's some neat tactical trick with knight f4 check holding up any taking of this d5 pawn. We have rook a1, bishop c4, knight f5. Rook e8. At this technical juncture of the game, uh, by the way, after this rook e8, not worried about knight takes h6 for some reason, you might ask the question, well, why can't white take on h6? What is the exact reason? Is it some positional consideration? Just knight h4 and the knight can't really go back without the double pawns. If we look, uh, there is there is that reason, reason that does exist that you can play knight h4 check. Uh, but there's bishop b3. This is, this is the marvellous resource, actually, which Stockfish has on analysis. Uh, not just the intuitive king g7, but bishop b3 means that this pin is potentially really uh, a really nice pin against uh, the bishop. So, for example, here, what does white do about that pin? So this really tactical reason is... Uh, can result in total devastation <laughs> for white. Uh, so yeah, you might have been wondering about this uh, moment here after king g3 was played. Why not knight takes h6? So a couple of reasons. Um, so knight h4 check, just to recap. Uh, so there's a really strong tactic, bishop b3, which shocks me, to be honest. Uh, but you could also uh, play rook e5 here as well. Uh, to discourage knight f5 and, and king g7 is going to be played. Uh, so this is even better than king g7 actually. This is, if you want to play uh, another strong move against this pesky uh, pawn capture, if white has to give back the pawn, this should be absolutely fine for black. Black's got the slight edge there as well. So yeah, there, there are specific reasons why the pawn, it can't be taken. Okay. King g3. Now we have rook e5. So this is really fascinating stuff that the rooks occupy the left and right of the isolated queen's pawn. You might ask why <laughs> why is this the case? Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Uh, white actually played h3 in this position and we have rook c6 White is not tempted to take this pawn. Uh, there's some nasty tactics, it seems, which just make this impossible. Uh, rook a d1, and now it's literally impossible. So knight f4 protecting h6 anyway. Knight d4. Rook goes to f6. Rook c1. King e7. We have here h4. King d6. So one of the perks of the rook on e5, it is holding g5 just in case anyway. Rook h1, rook e8, check. The king comes to c5. This square c4 looks to be quite exciting if the black king can get to c4. Knight e3, rook f e6, knight f5. And here, a very interesting move indeed. Uh, a price to be paid for further infiltration into the white possession. A price of admission into the c4 square is played and paid 
by Leela with this next move. I wonder if you can guess it. If I give you five seconds to pause the video, black to play here, what should you do with black? Okay. And you might think, oh, hold on a sec. <laughs> this is not possible, is it? But bishop e2 was played. It seems to fall into a fork, knight d4, threatening knight takes e6 jack, and, you know, holding e2. However, Leela here, guess what? What does Leela play in this position? Okay. With the price of a positional exchange sacrifice, it seems as though, well, a few things have now, are now happening uh, in this position. Uh, the knight reinforces quite strongly this isolated queen's pawn. The king has a ticket now to go into the c4 square to start hitting c3. So who's winning this debate now? <laughs> the double pawns or the isolated queen's pawn? It seems as though black's potential for evolution is clear. If black can win start actually concretely winning the c3 pawn, then these guys can start moving forward and there's a lot of pressure going to be exerted on the white position. And also a5 could be weaker later. We see king c4, rook dd1. The king does snap c3. The knight's holding d5 here after all. Rook a1, d4. These pawns are going forward. King takes c2 would only be a draw. Uh, check. There's too many checks going on here. Uh, there's check city there. That would be a draw. So uh, just d4 for the moment. So one pawn uh, for the exchange. But knight d5, this knight's uh, switching over now to put more pressure maybe on c2, knight b4. We have check, the king goes to d2, rook b2, knight c6, and there's a possibility now of king c1 and king b1 to harass the rook and win the c2 pawn. c2 pawn goes, then the d pawn's a big pass pawn. The king's cut off uh, from stopping that pass pawn. So this looks like a rather desperate check, this discovered check from the rook, c4 check. Uh, so for example, just to put some something like that on the board, rook a2, king c1 is a killer move. The king's being far too adventurous here. Uh, after he had just taken this pawn, this is very, very nice for black. So uh, we have c4 immediately, king c3, so um, hitting that rook here. Uh, c takes, we have that taking that, b takes, king c3. And the, the thing is, uh, this is actually really favourable for black, believe it or not, this position. Uh, we have rook d8. You might consider well c7, but what happens after rook e7? Yeah, forget the Tarash rule here with rook c6. Rook e7 is sufficient in this position. In fact, stronger perhaps because it cuts the king still uh, from touching this pawn. So this pawn's like ready to roll. Uh, so for example, this position is, is just going to be easy for black. So that would be a great move there. Uh, so we have uh, rook d8 just uh, giving up that pawn. King e2, check. And now rook e5, hitting that pawn, a5 pawn. Uh, so Leela's actually won the theoretical battle, it seems, in this particular game. Uh, now with this very, very nice endgame, which is uh, winning, basically, this rook and pawn ending. Uh, and it carries on for a bit. But, um, yep, it's pretty nice. Uh, White's just losing all the pawns and resigns here. So there's actually... A bit of a theoretical novelty by Leela displayed in this game against the sideline system G3, which is designed totally against black playing D5, you could argue. Nevertheless, Leela played D5, accepted the isolated queen's pawn, did some real magic with the rooks <laughs> around it, uh, managed to get a route in with the king to C4, uh, an exchange sacrifice winning that pawn uh, provided support for further evolution of the position basically to gather further compensation for the exchange sack so I think this is rewriting our understanding of that structural debate in particular double pawns versus isolated queen's pawn uh, a very interesting game example indeed but uh, if you don't like the isolated queen's pawn uh, you know d6 as mentioned uh, instead of d5 uh, and you might want to check out this um, Sicilian Defence Four Knights course. So an excellent new course. Uh, so at King's Crusher TV, Sicilian Four Knights, if you want to check that out.
Okay. Thanks very much.